And now we have a, a gentleman who actually I've rarely met someone so dedicated and so committed and so earnest and with whom I have as much respect as Mr. David DeGraw. Also to your left, David, you might point out our new uh, logo, which it just got uh, delivered to us by uh, folks on the team of Mr. Shepard Ferry. So. Right, Shepard Perry right over there. You know, since this movement has started, I got to meet a lot of great people, a lot of inspiring people that I've admired through my life. Um, about a month and a half ago when I first met, uh, about a month before I first met Reverend Hunter, I was invited to Russell Simmons' office to meet with him, and I thought, all right, that's pretty cool, I get to meet with Russell Simmons. But when I got there, Dr. Ben Chavis was there, and that was really cool to meet Dr. Ben Chavis. You know, he, his entire life has been a battle. He worked with Dr. Martin Luther King. Uh, you know, of course, he fought, you know, against segregation. He spent time in jail. I mean, he's done it all. He's really paved the way. And uh, so Dr. Chavis had this idea of merging the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King with Occupy Wall Street and forming Occupy the Dream. Uh, you know, Dr. Chavis has just overwhelmed me with the stories he's told from working with Dr. King and that he sees Occupy Wall Street as the, the continuation of the fight for economic justice that Dr. King started. You know, when Dr. King was organizing the Poor People's Campaign, there were not as many people living in poverty as there are today in America. The inequality of wealth in America today is worse than it was in Dr. Martin Luther King's time, as insane as that sounds. So, you know, this was a very inspiring, you know, coalition that we formed. Uh, we, we got to go to D.C. where I met with Reverend Hunter and uh, Reverend Jamal Bryant. And uh, there's been actions all through this country at Federal Reserves today to mark the beginning of this, this movement, this campaign. And uh, the, from what I hear in all the other uh, cities, it's been spectacular. The turnout's been great. The energy's been great. Um, just real quick, uh, a lot of people say, why the Federal Reserve? Uh, you know, what's the connection? And uh, when people say that, I, I, I just don't even know what they're talking about. You know, they have like two heads when they say that. You know, the, the Federal Reserve is the central planning force behind our economy. I mean, they, you know, Ben Bernanke, the Federal Reserve Chairman, when we were first organizing for Occupy Wall Street, in, in the run-up to that, we were protesting the Fed, and, you know, we were comparing it to Egypt. Egypt had Mubarak, and they were all calling for Mubarak to step down. So we were going to the New York Fed, and we were calling for Bernanke to step down, because he was our Mubarak. You know, I mean, the Federal Reserve moved around $29 trillion of our money in secrecy. And, and what did they do with that money? You know, they, they gave it to the big banks who destroyed the economy. You know, that there's been many, many different Federal Reserve programs, but, you know, some, some, some quick highlights, you know. They gave near zero interest loans to, to the big banks who destroyed the economy. And those big banks then gave that money back to the American government at three to five percent interest. So, like, does any anyone does everyone understand how ridiculous that is? Near zero interest loans, and then they give it back to the American government for three to five percent interest. I mean, this is the ultimate. It's it's a criminal racket. It's the Wall Street mafia. And this this you know, Bernanke is is the godfather of the of the Wall Street racket. Exactly. Okay, so I, I don't want to go on off on a big tangent. Because I didn't really give you your due introduction, can you talk about the beginning of the 99% movement and also how you got, when you were coming to D.C., about the process of talking to all the different Wall, Occupy Wall Street folks? Okay. Um, so the 99% movement... In February of 2010, I, I was reporting on the economic crisis, and I was just so sick of reporting on it over and over again about these crimes. Uh, so I wrote this six-part investigative series called The Economic Elite versus the People of the United States. And the entire thing was going through, you know, record unemployment, the explosion in poverty, 
the, the all-time record-breaking gap between the top 1% and the remaining 99%, um, the inequalities throughout America, and how unemployment was undercounted, not counting, you know, part-time people who are looking for full-time work, long-term and unemployed. So I w went through this whole thing, and I basically said that, you know, 99% of the population across the political spectrum, whatever your views are, we need to find common ground and come together. So that it was a big call to start a 99% movement. So, you know, this went on for about a year online, and we kept looking for common threads to where we can all agree. And the biggest part that we can agree on, which Dylan Radigan over there is going to talk about in a little bit, <laughs> is getting money out of politics. We, right. we had what we call the system of political bribery, campaign finance, lobbying, and the revolving door between Washington and Wall Street. So people came together to support getting money out of politics, and they also came together to support breaking up the banks. So people across the political spectrum agreed on those things consistently. Then this group called Ad Busters came along, and they put out their call, and they said, what are your demands? Turned out that that was a brilliant call because everyone came forward with demands. But our key demands of getting money out of politics and breaking up the banks has been pushed to the back. So the 99% movement has obviously evolved far beyond what we've done, and it's become this you know, cacophony of different issues. And I think it's important it stays that way. But you know, my focus personally is on getting money out of politics right now. But speaking next is Dylan Radigan from MSNBC. He has a new book out there, Green Dylan has been a huge supporter. He was coming down to Liberty Park from the beginning, you know, helping to rally the troops and get more people out. He, you know, I've actually been on his uh, show a few times. Been a, you know, just amazing. This guy kept me sane during the economic crisis and the bailout because he was the only guy on TV who was actually speaking the truth. Yeah. 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 So Dylan people. to start uh, today because of the nature of what today is by giving you an example of how the kitchen table issues of our time, whether it is unemployment, whether it is poverty, whether it is the dysfunction in our educational system, whether it's the poor nutrition that has infected so much of our society, uh, whatever the kitchen table issue may be, uh, unfortunately, every time you try to go down the rabbit hole to figure out why it is that we uh, have all these problems, inevitably they lead you back to the corrupting and, and briberous relationship between the special interests that are financing our government and the interests of the communities of this country. Uh, and I, was, I had the privilege today of, of publishing a piece uh, in partnership with Russell Simmons and Ben Chavis uh, on what we call the mathematics of racism. And uh, what you'll see when you look at, at the data is that we have more black and Hispanic men today in prison than we had slaves in 1850. No joke. We have, in this country today, 40% of our inmates are black men, and yet only 14% of our population is black men. When you look, I, can, I, I won't rattle, I'll, I'll, in fear of horrifying you, I'm going to stop <laughs> uh, rattling off data. The second thing that I will bring to your attention, though, is this. When you look in the prospectus of the publicly traded private prison operation companies, the number one risk factor that they speak to as a risk to the profits of a private industrial or private prison industrial complex is the risk of more lenient minor drug laws. Right. They say about our profits for fear that there could be a reform movement building relative to our incarceration of nonviolent criminal offenses tending towards possession of marijuana. Okay. It's a joke. When you look a little deeper, you realize that the money that is coming from those prison industrial industry businesses is being paid to our federal politicians and to our state politicians. And so when you look 
And that's why we called it the mathematics of racism. When you look at the net effect, which is the destruction of generation after generation of vital young men and women in this country that is being perpetrated by virtue of the lack of courage and the lack of compassion and most importantly the lack of resolve that you see in the American political apparatus and its utter corruption at the hands of the bribery of campaign finance. Yeah. I could sit here and give you the same speech relative to why it is that our health care is so expensive and, and, and treats people so poorly. I could give you the same speech as to why our energy, and our energy efficiency ratios are stuck in 1950 while the rest of the world has moved to 2012. I could do this with our educational apparatus. The narrative of the kitchen table issue for you, whoever you may be, and everybody has different things that are affecting them. You have to understand that, that, unfortunately, the barrier to resolving those issues goes to the on-ramp that is the briberous relationship between the funding of our politicians and the policies that they make. So what do we do, right? You're already doing it, is the answer. And what I mean is this. What we are seeing in this country, not just in this group of people here, but in groups all over this country, is the internal realization. You don't need me to come here and tell you this. You are, you are realizing this by virtue of being a human being who can consume information, right? And the beautiful thing about what we're witnessing is I would sit, I would, you know, I'd sit there like with Dave DeGraw crazy, screaming at the wall in my apartment in New York, you know? We gotta tell everybody. And we gotta, you actually don't have to tell everybody. What you have to do is realize that as you become aware yourself, that the onus is on us as we become aware ourselves to engage and act, which is what is happening. And the course or the trajectory of this is on multiple levels at the same time. So what we're looking at here is a Federal Reserve Bank, right? And I want to be very clear. Banks, by their definition, are neither evil nor good. They are a place where money is kept. That's all they are. It's like a hammer. I can use it to break your toe, or I can use it to build a house. In this particular instance, and just to uh, infuriate you a little bit further, if David DeGraw <laughs> didn't do a good job, or if I haven't really gotten you worked up at all yet, it is important for you to understand that in addition to all the dysfunction and all the lack of investment and everything that we're suffering as a result of the, the banking system in this country, it's important that you understand that much the same as we assign a special privilege to law enforcement in this country to carry weapons and to theoretically administrate justice, which many of them, by the way, do a very good job of that, and, 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 and that's a, a, a different issue. We assign special privileges to banks as taxpayers to allow them a number of privileges on the expectation that in doing so, they will facilitate investment in our communities. It is right. the only reason, by the way, right. that we give banks special privileges. Right. The same way we give law enforcement special privileges is on the expectation that law enforcement will not abuse that privilege, but will utilize that privilege in the interest of the community. We are giving special privileges to the banks of this country and the, and the Western world on the ostensible um, argument that that special privilege serves our interests because then they invest in our communities. Over the past three years, at our peak, we gave roughly $30 trillion for a brief period of time to keep the financial system functional. Right now, we're probably on the hook for 3 or $4 trillion that they still have. We are told that we've done this in order to facilitate investment in our country. And yet, if you look at the lending from the banks in this country over the past three years, they have reduced lending, especially to small businesses and communities, by $1 trillion. So simultaneously, they are taking trillions from us while reducing the actual investment that is supposed to be accorded to the privilege of the rights that they are uniquely granted by us, the people. This comes to the issue of awareness and understanding that it is not that, that, that you, your position is could not be more just, that your narrative is not a political narrative, that this is not a left narrative, that this is not a right narrative, that this is a justice narrative, much the same as the Martin Luther King narrative was a narrative of justice, was a narrative of fairness, was a narrative of decency 
We are not, we are being bamboozled by the pro wrestling of left right politics to distract us from the base breach of justice that is being perpetrated against all of us by virtue of the two political parties' agreement to facilitate a corrupt banking system, energy inefficiency, lousy health care, on and on and on. So, how do we do this? And this comes to the investment area. It is clear that the, the large-scale, multi-trillion dollar systems that we all have become reliant upon for investment, our trade agreements, our banking system, and our tax code. Those are the only three things that dictate the flow of what happens to money, our tax code, our trade agreements, and our banking system. What we're seeing is the symptoms of that lack of investment. The unemployment is a symptom. The poverty is a symptom. All these issues that we are feeling, that pain that we feel, is symptomatic of that lack of investment. And so it is imperative that as we demand a, rest a restoration of justice in the American government through a pursuit of a constitutional amendment to get money out of politics, which will happen, I'll get to that in one second, then I'll shut up. <laughs> it is also important that we understand that when you are lacking investment from the sort of the super apparatus, that your only alternative is to do what you are doing, confront it, but also Make the effort to invest in yourself and the people that are nearest to you in your communities. That's right. That's right. That's right. Because they may be able to take away the flow of money from the pie in the sky, but they can never take away our ability to invest with one another in order to care for one another, in order to educate one another, in order to develop our own resources yeah. internally in order to ensure our own community has its vitality because at this time for as as mighty as this fight will become it surely will not happen soon enough there's no way i can tell those children in the in the van that you were referring to that they just need to wait for me to get with a bunch about 300 million people and pass a constitutional amendment and then they're going to be okay they don't have that kind of time and so the beautiful thing about what's happening is we are on two fronts the, 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 the big narrative, we're going to China, we're going to separate business from state, and then today on the deck of the boat, we're going to look after one another through an investment in one another. Uh, and if you'll uh, indulge me, I just I, I, wonder, I wrote down a quote that I wanted to read to you because it struck me when I was coming in here uh, today. Uh, and I feel like uh, the occupation movement and everything that we're experiencing uh, in general, uh, it, that this speaks to that. And it, and it says this, it says, the basic difference between an ordinary person and a warrior is that a warrior takes everything as a challenge, while an ordinary person takes everything as a blessing or a curse. And here is to the warrior and every one of you, and here is to the challenge of our time, which is the restoration of justice through the investment in one another and the demands that our country once again invest in our own people, as opposed to the preservation of their own interests at our expense. And thank you for letting me speak. Thank you.